else, go ahead and be seated. Um, Anthony, can you pass these out for me? Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to have you all in Sunday school here. Thank you so much. We are going to be in a preparatory Sunday school class for the summer ministry. It's basically... We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're going to look at a few verses there and then some ver other verses elsewhere. Um, there's a verse in here which I found very interesting. It kind of uses a phrase which um, is the only place I ever found it in the Bible in this verse here. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 15 through 16. The Bible says, I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that the first fruits that is, the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you submit yourselves unto such and to every one that helpeth with us and laboreth. Today we're going to be looking at the subject of addicted to the ministry, and in particular, how can I be addicted to the ministry of Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church this summer? Let's pray. Dear God, please be with us as we look into your word and help us to See things the way you see them and value what you value this morning. Convict our hearts of, of uh, self-centeredness and uh, sin in our lives. Help us to see these things as, uh, as bad and see them as you see them. And to see the results of allowing sin in our lives and allowing weights and things which distract us from service to you. Help us please to see the uh, necessity of having a heart which desires to serve and work in our hearts please this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, this morning we're looking... Good morning, everyone, uh, at the passage. Anthony, can you give them some uh, Sunday school lessons, please? We're looking at the passage, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 15 through 16. There's a phrase here we're looking at particularly that talks about Stephanus, the house of Stephanus, about how they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And what we're going to be looking at this morning is uh, addicted to the ministry and... Uh, Particularly, how can I be addicted to the ministry of Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church this summer? Well, um, uh, one small disclaimer. Unfortunately, it, the, this is the pure irony of this class. I will be gone the next three weeks. So you'll have to give me a free pass on that one. I've got to do my best to woo Kathleen with my charms. So I will be out, out of town on a honeymoon with her. When you get married, it seems to be prerequisite that you have to have a honeymoon and um, attempt to convince her that it wasn't such a bad idea to marry me after all. It's kind of like, you know, blowing smoke into a hive of bees, or I guess, or something. Anyway, uh, she's wonderful, and it's going to be a great time. But uh, So that is the irony of it, Pastor Price pointed out, that I'll be gone the first three weeks of June and through a lot of the stuff, but uh, pay heed to it anyway. Addicted to the ministry, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 15 through 16. We'll look at uh, addiction defined. And I looked up addiction in the uh, Webster's 1828 dictionary. I know what uh, addicted means from a medical standpoint and such, but uh, addicted kind of gives us more of the thrust, the feel of exactly what your King James Bible is referring to in this verse. And uh, it's a good translation of the Greek. It says uh, basically in... Uh, in the uh, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, it says, Addiction is devotion by customary practice. So basically, by being constantly doing something, customarily doing something, it's your custom, it's your habit, you become devoted to it. Um, there was one time I had this big bag of chocolates in my room. So every time I'd go in my room, I'd eat a chocolate out of, or two out of that bag of chocolates. And so after a while, it kind of became my custom is eating a chocolate or more out of the bag of chocolates. And so the day I ran out of chocolates and the next day I came in to look for chocolates, there were none there. I had become devoted to those chocolates by customary practice. And addiction is something we constantly think about. It's something we plan for, we work towards, and we constantly take part in as much as we can. It's interesting... Um, with uh, drug addicts, you see this often, alcohol addicts also. Um, in particular, it comes to mind uh, some of the more expensive drug addicts. Um, if they start buying their drug or whatever it is and they start using it because it's what satisfies them and the only thing what satisfies them. 
and uh, they start craving more and more and more of it and they start trying to get more and more of it pretty soon they start having problems at work because of their addiction they uh, get fired from their job usually um, if they get far enough into it and then what happens is they pawn everything in their house they sell their furniture they sell clothes they pawn off TV they pawn anything off they take to stealing they start doing anything they can to get at that drug um, and the reason why is because they're addicted it's the most important thing in life to them and it's uh, pretty foolish for a person to make the most important thing in his life a temporary high a sudden temporary release from his problems followed by more and worsening miseries thereafter um, being addicted to the ministry of Christ doesn't do that to a person it makes a person a better worker at his job it makes a person a better Christian to be around it makes him a better family member it makes him a better of all these things I think sometimes Christians worry about being addicted to the ministry of the church because they're afraid it'll take their life over if they give their life completely to Christ and it's supposed to it's supposed to we Christians we value the wrong things but when Christ takes your life over he doesn't make it a worse life he makes it better and he makes it what it's supposed to be and what it always is supposed to have been um, uh, concerning addiction to the ministry uh, that clock is wrong so I'm going to put this here so I know what's going on uh, concerning addiction to the ministry addiction comes as a result of devoting oneself on a habitual basis to the work of the ministry uh, just like I got adjusted to the chocolates by habitually eating the chocolates whenever I went by them so a person becomes addicted to the ministry by getting involved in the ministry you don't just get addicted to the ministry of the church if you will by uh, going once to church and perhaps one time taking part of one aspect of the church you uh, become addicted to the ministry devoted to the ministry if you will by jumping in whole hog both feet first no reserves um, addiction to the ministry it's the result of frequent involvement in and partaking of the ministry it requires joining the church and serving with the brethren in the church um, it says here in verse 16 1 Corinthians chapter 15 it says that ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth so here he says you've got this household of Stephanus and uh, they uh, they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints basically they're active workers in the church and the command is basically that you submit yourself to them which means basically go do the work they're doing with them and uh, let them tell you what to do and work with them and uh, become busy in their work in the church and uh, to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth so kind of the idea there good morning is basically get involved in your church um, when we get involved in the church we're submitting ourselves to the vision of the pastor and the direction of the church and jumping on board without reservation to the work you cannot be addicted to the ministry of the church if you're not showing up to church services you can't be addicted to the ministry of the church if you th um, have an attitude about the church that well the church uh, doesn't really belong to be like first place in my life church is a very important thing in Christ's mind it talks about how Christ died for the church how he loved it and gave himself for it um, we will never be successfully addicted to the church if we have reservations about the church um, if you can't find a good church to go to move to one and find a good church if you're too good for all the churches anywhere then there's a problem with you and you've got a critical spirit but if you find a good church get rid of the critical spirit uh, join wholeheartedly and jump on board without any reservations uh, take whatever reservations you have to the cross and get rid of them if a person is holding on to reservations about the church either something's wrong with them or something's wrong with the church so either find a good church or take care of what's wrong with you um, this matter of being addicted to the ministry of joining in the ministry of the church wholeheartedly is a very important matter because what is at stake is lost souls that's why it's so important is because hell fire for people we should be loving is their fate if we don't become involved in the church like we want to be God has a place for each of us in the church and we need to be in that place and when we're not in that place we're not doing the ministry of the church and the church is 
less effective in what it should be effective in. Um, there's a lot of different things we'll be involved in in this summer. They are printed in the bulletin. There's a, in the summer ministry prayer list. And uh, it, by prayer list, what's so, the sort of prayer about it is, of course, be praying for God to provide in those things and then pray the sort of prayer, Here am I, Lord, send me. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of harvest, that he may send forth laborers into his harvest. So that's kind of the idea there. Um, we need to be involved in these ministries because lost souls are at stake. We need to be involved in these ministries too because there's a lot of saved people around who aren't in church who ought to be in church. I go to, you know, going door to door, I meet a number of people who are saved but don't go to church anywhere. Is that going to turn out good for their kids if they're not going to church anywhere? Is that going to help their kids grow up to serve Christ? Will that help their kids grow up? Uh, grow up to stay away from cults. You know, there's cults going around trying to scoop up kids and teens. Uh, you got the Jehovah's Witnesses going around. I, they knock on my door probably once a month. Um, I get Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on my door and asking, can they come back? I always tell them yes, so it wastes more of their time. And I grab as much of their literature as I can figure out how to get. So uh, there's nothing wrong with that, and it's actually a good thing because it takes their time up instead of... Uh, going around trying to uh, damage lost souls. Pretty much every time they come back, I'm asleep too. It's the beauty of my work night shift. Um, this one guy came back probably four or five times. Um, if a Jehovah's Witness can come to my stubborn house four or five times, we should be able to go to the house of some poor lost soul or some straying saved soul four or five times or more and tell them that they need to come to church. Um, there's a number of people who come to this church who it took a long time to get active in this ministry. Um, especially, I think, of a number of the teens. It took several <coughs> years to get some of them active in the church. And uh, we won't win these people into the church if we're not dedicated to the work of the church. So let's talk about some distractions, some uh, distractions from serving in the ministry of the church. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. <coughs> Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So here we have a, an idea of some things which can distract us. Uh, the Kind of the picture of this chapter is, back in chapter 11, uh, basically... The author of Hebrews goes on to discuss all these people who by faith wrought these great victories for God. And he goes on to say about how they believed in the promises even though they didn't see them yet. And uh, he says in verse 3, Now all these, having retain, obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So we have all these people, they obtained a good report, and it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. So that's those witnesses, those people from this past chapter, and others who've gone before us and been faithful to Christ. Um, and the, kind of the idea here it talks about is us running like a race. We have all these testimonies of those who've gone before us, and their testimony of them having been faithful means that through the same God who they believed in, we can have faith to wreak victories too. I find it interesting. It mentions four judges in chap Hebrews chapter 11. These four judges are Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah. If you read the book of Judges, these are probably the four, from man's perspective, least successful judges. What did Gideon do wrong? Good morning. How did Gideon mess up? What happened with Gideon? Who remembers from Pastor Price's sermon the other day? Yeah. He went into idolatry. 
He got himself a whole bunch of wives, had a whole bunch of kids. He fell into idolatry and he made a snare unto Israel. So that was a problem. Uh, Barak. What was Barak's problem? Charlie, what was Barak's problem? He was a coward. Um, all right, what was uh, Samson's problem? Yeah, he fell to lust at the end of his ministry. He did good for 20 years and fell to lust. I guess he, he got frustrated, and as Pastor Price said, it, probably a lot of that was because the people of God weren't being what they were supposed to be. He was standing alone. He beat the Philistines down, and 3,000 of his people came to give him over to the Philistines. They were like, well, we got this strong guy on our side. He can kill Philistines like it's nothing. Let's make it so there's not a problem. Let's get rid of him. Instead of, hey, this guy can beat the enemies up. Let's take care of the bad guys. It's like, hey, this guy can beat the enemies up. This is going to cause us problems. Samson fell in the sin. That's just kind of a, another plug for being addicted to the ministry and being part of the ministry of the church. If you aren't who you're supposed to be in the church, you cause problems for those who are trying to stand. Um the more of us there are standing together, the easier it is to stand and the stronger the stand we can take. The Roman soldiers were known for their rigorous discipline and training, but uh, the average Roman soldier was kind of short. He was strong enough, but the average Roman soldier was not as physically strong as either the uh, German soldiers they usually faced, the tribal Germans, or the tribal uh, Celtic warriors they faced. The, the both of them were often quite taller, more than a foot taller often. They were often very strong. Um, they were very fierce warriors. Why did the Romans consistently win battles against both the Germanic and Celtic tribes? Discipline. Discipline. They fought in unison. They'd hold their shields together. They'd march forward. They'd kind of endure the charging wild warriors and spears and things and just kind of march right over everybody in unison. Um, something they'd do when they'd attack the walls of a city is a, a, a little group of them would put their shields over top of each other and their shields around each other. And this formation they'd call a turtle formation. And uh, they could march right up to the walls, ignorant of the rocks and flames and spears being thrown at them because they were protected because everybody was in his place holding his shield. So it's important for us to be in our place in the church because... Um, if not, we can cause problems for other believers, like uh, poor Samson. What happened to Jephthah? What did Jephthah do? He made, a foolish he made a foolish promise. He stumbled in his faith there. He knew God had called him to do that, but he stumbled in his faith, and he made a foolish promise. And he put God in a bad position. He tempted the Lord, as, as, he, as said. So he made a bad decision there. But these people are still included in this chapter because who made them strong wasn't themselves and wasn't their perfection. It's the God they believed in. Honestly, we're just as wicked and troubled and cowardly as Gideon and Samson and Jephthah and David, maybe. We haven't committed all the same sins that these guys have, but we have the same wicked flesh and we've done our own different sins. But our God is mighty and our God will use us if we have faith in him. So here we go back into uh, Hebrews chapter 12. It says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. All right. Imagine we have a runner in a race. That's kind of what it's saying here. Run with race, patience the race that is set before us. We're in a race. And I decide I'm going to do weight training while I'm running my race. While running my race, I'm going to do curls to try to strengthen my arms. Um, supposing I'm running against Devin, and of course I'm faster than Devin, um, probably. If I'm doing curls, my odds of beating Devin drop dramatically. Is it easy to do curls while running? Is it easy to run while holding 10, 20, 30 more extra pounds? It's pointless. Um... So we're commanded to lay aside every weight. Sometimes runners for training, they'll strap these little ankle weights on themselves. Uh, I've seen them do that for training. They'll strip ankle weights on themselves. So as they run, I guess it, uh, they have to work harder to run. Um, I don't know exactly what the uh, exact physiologic purpose they do it for is. I think it might be to strengthen their calves. I don't know for sure. But anyway, they strap ankle weights on themselves. Should a runner who is running his race 
And it's the race for real, not the training race. Would a runner who's running his race want to keep his ankle weights on himself? Well, not if he wants to win, no. Um, so the Bible commands us to lay aside every weight. Now, the idea behind a weight is it's something which is basically holding us back from serving Christ, but it's perhaps not per se in of itself wickedness. That's the best I can decide about what these weights are. Um, weights are not worth what they cost us in terms of eternal opportunity and treasure. There can be different things which can hold us back from serving Christ, uh, which can take our time up. Um, these things, they can come in all kinds of... Uh, stripes and colors and as many of us as there are there's many different weights as could hold us back and uh slow us down from our service to christ um in particular y'all tell me what are some things which could hold a person back from serving christ and slow them down it's not a bad thing per se but it could slow a person down from serving christ charlie shout it out Relationships, that's a big one which often inhibits people from service to Christ. Some, oftentimes it's even family relationships. Families are very important. Um, the family is the first institution God created. Uh, God believes very strongly in the family. Unfortunately, sometimes people get their priorities skewed. There's people who uh, miss church sometimes because their family had them caught up into something. Um there's sometimes people will um, be unavailable to serve in any real aspect in the church because their entire week is caught up in family activities. Yes. Where your treasure is, there is your heart also. That's true. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Because you put your put probably before you have your devotions, you might be doing what what you know what you're into first, and then have devotions. It's kind of like putting something before the Lord. Yeah, it could be. Um, it's an interesting thing is families are very important. And if a person neglects a person's family, it can really hurt his family. Um, and it can cause problems. If a person has lost family members, this becomes a particularly uh, troubled situation often, knowing when to tell family members no. But honestly, if a family obligation starts getting in the way of church, you need to reevaluate what's going on. Um, the, uh, the truth is, is, God is supposed to be first, and if we put family first instead of God first, we develop kind of an idol in our hearts and we make a monster out of it. Um, um, very important thing to do is to get a person's family into church and to get a person's family loving church. Uh, sometimes I've heard people say, well, my kids don't like church. You know, my kids are bored of church. Usually the reason kids are bored about church is because their parents are bored about church. Mm -hmm. That's the real reason. Their parents don't like church. They pretend to, because that's what they're supposed to do. But they, uh, they're they bored about church, and so their kids are bored about church. Kids like what their parents like. They really do. Um, kind of interestingly enough, uh, this is an illustration Will Rice uses all the time. His kids hate onions. And his kids have probably never touched an onion before. And the reason his kids hate onions, or at least hate onions on their hamburgers, is because he hates onions on his hamburgers. And they follow right along. Um, Kathleen hates ketchup. And the reason she hates ketchup is because her mom hates ketchup. Those of y'all who know me know that this is absolutely hilarious because I pour ketchup on things. So, um, our kids are going to be a double mind concerning ketchup. Uh, but they will be won over to its sweet flavors. Um, but the truth is, is, our kids do follow after us and do what we do, and they like what we like as parents. Yeah, if a parent likes something, the kids learn to like it. If a parent develops kind of this critical attitude, kids pick up on it real fast. Um, the parent who criticizes the church, his kids will criticize the church the same way and they'll turn out to be <coughs> rebels. And uh, what is the rebellion inside a parent's heart comes out in the action of their children. <coughs> uh, kids are real quick to pick up on those kind of things. So get your family into church and make church part of your family life. Um, 
church time and family time do not have to be mutually exclusive functions. Uh, then there's friendship relationships, which can distract a person from church and from the ministries of the church. And this happens a lot, too. A believer has something going on in his life, and uh, church has something going on. Well, the friends drag him out from church. How's the believer supposed to lead his friends to Christ or help him grow if they're the ones who are dictating terms, not uh, God to him? It can't happen. There's other weights. Sometimes our hobbies can be a weight. There's nothing per se wrong with a hobby, but if a hobby takes you out of church and makes you ineffective for the ministry, it's a weight. Um, if the hobby takes up more time than it needs to, if the hobby gets you out of the Bible, if the hobby leads you in the sin, it's, it's a bad thing. Weights make us want to quit ministry because they make it too hard to serve, or they draw us into that weight. They kind of suck us into it. Things have kind of a habit of kind of drawing you into them more and more. And if you get too uh, into something which isn't serving Christ, it's not going to be effective uh, in the eternal sense. And then there's sin. So you have weights, it says, and um, uh, lay aside the weights, lay aside the sins. Sins keep us from ministry. They separate us from fellowship with God. Sin separates us from fellowship of the brethren. Sin changes our focus, and sins make us unprofitable servants. If we as believers will go ahead and hold on to a little sin, it will often end up becoming a much bigger problem than we thought it would down the road. Um, we, we often like to think, well, this problem is just a small problem. This addiction to something other than Christ, it's only a little thing. This thing which satisfies me, which isn't the ways of God, is, it's a small thing but it becomes very big in the end and very destructive. No sin is worth the grief it causes the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. No sin we could ever possibly commit is worth grieving the Holy Spirit over, if you think about it. No sin is worth the pain it causes the body of Christ. Um, when we sin, it does affect others around us. Uh, they say a, a bad apple spoils the whole barrel, and a bad apple does other things to the whole barrel too, if you will. It causes problems and pain to the body of Christ around us. It saddens the body of Christ. It hurts others when we sin, and no sin is worth the lost opportunities for ministry and witnessing. It's not worth it to sin because you'll lose the chance to lead others to Christ. You'll lose the chance to help fellow believers. It's not worth it. Sin makes us want to quit ministry by drawing us into it. It entices us. It also by discouraging us and drawing us away from the source of our power. A discouraged Christian is a Christian who's falling into sin. If a Christian gets discouraged in the ministry, it's because they're taking their eyes off Christ and something's sucking them away from Christ. And sins will discourage us. And they'll cause us to be, want to quit serving. They'll cause us to... Uh, Refuse to be addicted to the ministry as it talks about in the Bible. It will cause us not to want to submit ourselves unto those serving and uh, to involve ourselves in the ministry. Dealing with distractions. Verse 2 there says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So... First, look unto Jesus, set your heart on Jesus, not on weights and sins. Uh, as Mrs. Dolan said a second ago, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you set your treasure on sin, it will be what you love. No man can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, he will cleave to the one and despise the other. Uh, Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon, and mammon is basically a word for money. You can't serve God and earthly gain. It will not happen. Um, set your heart on Jesus, not on weights and sins. Change what you value from the worthless to the Savior. Um, we sin because we think it's worth it to sin. Bible in uh, Proverbs, I think it's chapter 10, verse 2, says, Treasures of wickedness profit nothing. Whatever gain you may establish by sinning isn't real gain. It's profiting you nothing, and it's going to destroy you in the end. Change what you value from the worthless to the Savior. Uh, set, basically, set your affections on things above. Colossians chapter 1. We've looked at this passage several times in these last few weeks, I think. 
It's a good passage to look at frequently. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. For if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. If you're risen with Christ, and that's kind of the idea of since you are risen with Christ, if you are and we are, therefore we need to seek that which is above, not the things on this earth. And this is why we need to addict ourselves to the ministry, because you will be addicted to something. That is a guarantee. There will be something which will take a hold of you. you. There will be something which will addict you. If nothing else, it will be laziness and apathy. But there will be something which will addict you. As Pastor Price liked to say, your calendar will fill itself. What are you filling your calendar with? What are you filling your life with? Are you addicted to the ministry? How important is it to you? It says... Uh, and seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So our heart needs to be set on things which are above. We have Christ waiting for us on the right hand of the throne of God. We have um, him who is the author and finisher of our faith, him who died for us, who rose again for us, who ever liveth to make intercession for us. Jesus who loves us and who has given us all these things, we need to set our affections on Him and not on things on this earth. This idea of being addicted to the ministry largely, in, it's in a, oftentimes, is a matter of priorities and what you set your priorities on. If you prioritize things which are going to burn instead of things which are eternal, you are prioritizing the wrong things and you have your heart set in the wrong place. Um, we need to look unto Jesus. We need to consider Jesus. Uh, it says, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So we consider Jesus who endured such contradiction. Jesus endured more than we ever have or will. He endured the full wrath of God against himself for all the sins of all time, on himself on the cross he endured such contradiction of sinners he endured um, his own people rejecting him he endured um, all the uh, spite and scorn on the cross he endured the beating on the uh, of the uh, the Romans he endured all these things for us and consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners uh, we need to consider all he's done for us we need to consider Jesus has provided all we need for life and godliness. It is not impossible for us to be a successful Christian. It's not impossible. It is not impossible for you to get victory over sin and to get a, right, a life which is right and is everything it's supposed to be. The Bible says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Where does our being godly, our being addicted to the ministry come from? Who gives us that ability and power? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does. It doesn't come from ourselves. So if the Holy Spirit gives us this, if it's according to God's divine power, and not according to our own strength, which of us then has an excuse to be a failure as a Christian? Well, none of us do. None of us do at all. Um, we need also to consider the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or or bad. So we're going to give account for the sort of servant we've been on this life. We'll give an account for the service we've done in the church in our life and even this summer. Whether or not we served actively in the church this summer will be accountable for it. Um, God does hold us accountable. What we do is not forgotten by God for good or for bad. 
He knows what we're doing, and so therefore we need to get rid of the distractions and sins. They're not worth it. Just get rid of them. Um, right now I'm busy trying to clean my room up and get everything ready for Katie to come. And so while we were trying to go through stuff, I'd grab something, look at it, and think, oh, wait, this is neat. I don't want to get rid of this. This is good, too. I'm not going to get rid of this. Um, basically, the way of getting rid of things from what I witnessed seems to be you grab it and you throw it out. <laughs> and that's how we need to get rid of our sins. That's what's going to happen to some of my clothes, probably not most of them. Um, probably a lot of things around the house, but then they need to get gotten rid of, too, maybe. Um, but that's how we get rid of sins and distractions in our life, you know? It's not worth it. T-shirts with small holes are apparently not worth it to keep. Um, pants with small holes in them are apparently not worth it to keep, I have been told. Um, they take up space. They occupy time. They waste time. They're worthless. They're useless. They are short of the mark of what... Um, <coughs> Katie has established. <laughs> and our sins we hold on to and our distractions we hold on to are the same. Um, the lies, the lusts, the covetousnesses, the lazinesses, the uh, rebellions, all these things we hold on to just aren't worth it. They're garbage, pitching without a second consideration because if you regard that iniquity, it's going to get you. Um, you won't get rid of it. How to get addicted to the ministry. So we looked at some of the negatives, basically. Let's look at the positives in our last few minutes here. Uh, let's look at some of the positives. How to get addicted to the ministry. Love what Christ loves. Uh, love the church and the ministries of the church. Um, what we love, we want to be with. We want to grow in. We, uh, we desire. Um, I love... Baked beans. And this one barbecue restaurant has baked beans. And I go there, but I don't really love those baked beans that much, so I don't show up there that much. Um, it's kind of a weird illustration, I guess. But the more you love something, the more you show up for it. I guess I love Taco Bell better because I go there more. Um, love the church and the ministries of the church. If you love the church, you'll show up. If you love the church, you'll join it, you'll take part in it, you'll grow in it, and you'll bring others to it. You'll uh, teach your children to love the church, and by teaching them to love the church, they'll grow up to love um, the things they're supposed to be instead of loving the world. And um, it's very important um, in the long run for us to love the things God loves, love the church, also love lost people. Love people in general, win the lost to Christ, love people who are saved and help them grow in Christ. Our brethren in Christ... We need to love them, and we need to be there for them in church. Um, it's very important for us to serve alongside each other and uh, help each other. Um, also, love what Christ loves. Christ loves the church. Christ loves the people in the church. Uh, Christ instituted the institution of the church. Um, it's not that we worship the church itself. We don't do what the Roman Catholics do and make it an institution we worship. But you love the church and you work, serve God through the church. That is how God works in this particular dispensation is through the church. In the last dispensation, he worked through national Israel. If you were a Gentile, your goal was to go join Israel and uh, believe in the true God and offer sacrifices and become a part of Israel. Well, we're not in that dispensation anymore. We who uh, were uh, Gentiles, if you will, according to the Spirit as it talks about, we became uh, saved. Our part is now in this dispensation to pour ourselves into the church. Also, eliminate a critical attitude. This will kill being addicted to the ministry as quick as anything, is having this critical attitude, this critical spirit. Um, if you're always finding fault with everything, and there's a difference between trying to help and to build something and just finding fault. There's a big difference between the two. It has to do with the heart's attitude. A critical spirit is kind of a manifestation of a rebellious spirit. So if you have a rebellious spirit, get rid of it. Uh, make service in the church your desire and satisfaction. Jesus said in John chapter 4, we've looked at this passage a few times lately too, Repetition aids memory. John chapter 4, verse 31 says, In the meantime, while his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I eat meat to eat that ye know not of. 
Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? So Jesus, his disciples, they come to him and say, they bring him some food, they tell him, Master, eat. And he says, you know, I've got meat to eat you don't know about. They say, well, somebody brought you meat. He says this, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. This needs to be our satisfaction is doing the will of God. Service in the church, winning the lost to Christ, uh, being active in the church, developing our fellow believers in the church. Um, it says, Say not ye there yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Bold I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. This needs to be our heart. Those fields are white to harvest, and we don't get to harvesting it. The harvest perishes. Finally, find the right church, join that church, and serve constantly in the church God put you in. Um, if you can't find a good church, move to a good church. If there are no good churches anywhere in the whole world, probably the problem isn't the church. Um, either eliminate your critical spirit or find a good church. And um, join that church. Serve constantly in the church God put you in. If you're not serving in the church, you're going to be backsliding. And the devil will figure out ways to slip into you different lies. Um, when you're not in the church, when you're supposed to be in church, the devil will put philosophies of this world into you. He'll take advantage of your weakness to attack you. Um, where I'm going to be going for a honeymoon, one of the places we're going to see uh, bison. And these bison, basically, their protective measure is kind of to stay in a herd. If I remember correctly, I think it's bison do this. Basically, when they spot a mountain lion or a pack of wolves or something, they kind of form this circular herd. And uh, the women and children get in the middle and all the bulls and the big women get in the circle on the outside with their horns pointing out. And uh, the bears and the lions and all those things, which there are up there, and uh, they're pretty fierce, they can't really get at them because if they try to, they get stabbed. Um, those Big old cows, they weigh a ton or two or more. I don't know what. And if they kick you, you're had. If they stab you with their horns, you're had. But if a cow, one of those cows gets sick and wandered from the herd, or if a kid gets rebellious and wanders away from his mother, they're pretty much mountain lion bait. They're, they're gone. Um, and the reason why is because they got away from the flock. And if we're not where we're supposed to be in the church, we expose ourselves to the attack of the devil. So... Be addicted to the ministry. Um, love what Christ loves. Serve Christ as his, he has commanded. And uh, I'll see you all in about three weeks. And next week is Mr. Lee's Sunday School. This is a very important Sunday School. This Sunday School, please show up for it. You have to. This is Lee's first time teaching Sunday School ever. Please show up for it. One, to encourage him. Two, to find something funny, he says. I'm sure he'll say something good. Um <laughs> The content could be good too. You never know. And the content will be smashing. It'll be the best Sunday school you've been in in a very long time, probably. Um, anyway, it'll be a great Sunday school. Bring somebody who has financial problems to it. He's talking about stewardship, right? By biblical stewardship, find someone who has financial problems and bring them to it because it'll really help them. And it'll help them see things God's way. Let's pray and be dismissed. Dear God, thank you for your word. For the undeserved privilege you've given us to uh, take part in the ministry. Uh, we are the chiefest of sinners, I especially. But thank you for your uh, giving us grace to take part in the ministry and to serve you. Help us, please, to be addicted to the ministry of the saints, to serve you, and to live for you and not the world. In Jesus' name, amen.